May I stand? Bonjour. Bonjour. This is not working. Bonjour. Bonjour. My microphone. Oops. Now it's working. Bonjour. Euh, bienvenue à cette deuxième conversation communautaire à l'Université York. Euh, merci d'avoir pris le temps de vous joindre à nous. Glendon, en tant que partie intégrante de l'Université York, reconnaît sa présence sur le territoire traditionnel de nombreuses nations autochtones. La région connue comme Takaronto a été préservée par la nation Nishnabek, la Confédération Haudenosaunee, les Hurons Wendat et les Métis. Elle est désormais le foyer d'un grand nombre de peuples autochtones. Nous reconnaissons les titulaires actuels du traité, la Première Nation des Mississauga de New Credit. Ce territoire est soumis au traité de la ceinture Wampum Dish with One Spoon, en tant que définissant le partage et la préservation pacifique de la région des Grands Lacs. Des membres de, des communautés de Keel et de Glendon euh, ont exprimé le désir d'avoir des occasions euh, d'échanger des idées dans une ambiance euh, sécuritaire et empreinte de respect. Voilà ce qu'on vous offre, qu'on nous offre aujourd'hui. I'd like to introduce you to your senior leadership team who are joining us today. President and Vice Chancellor Rhonda Lenton, Vice President and Provost Lisa Phillips, President of Finance and Administration Carol McCauley, Vice President of Research and Innovation Rob Ashi, Vice President of Advancement Jeff O'Hagan. They will be responding to your questions today according to their respective portfolios. Cet événement est bilingue. On est à Glendon après tout. Nous vous encourageons à vous exprimer dans la langue de votre choix, que ce soit le français ou l'anglais. Si vous avez besoin de services d'interprétation, veuillez vous prévaloir des écouteurs à la porte. If you have a need for interpreting services which are being provided, please take this opportunity to get a uh, écouteur, I'm sorry, this is not the last time that will happen, a headset, uh, please note that you will be asked for a piece of ID. Um, uh, I think that is all the instructions we need for now. Uh, so we will have a conversation, uh, a lengthy one, uh, but before we get to the questions, I'd like to invite President Lenton to make her opening remarks. Okay. I'm just listening to the last little bit of the translation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bonjour, bienvenue à tous. Okay, I might, I might need to pull this because uh, I, I think I'll pull this until we actually get to the Q&A. That would be a little bit better. Oh, you, none of you will know why I'm pausing constantly while it's coming in my ear. Um, uh, so bonjour as well, and uh, we're very much looking forward to having this time to chat with you. Um, we wanted to not spend too much time on the presentation and just highlight a little bit. Uh, so that we could really lead the time for the questions and the answers and have a conversation with the community. Um, so the, I think someone is, has to move the French along, and that's not me. So Neville, the French, okay, very good. So we've already done the introduction, so I'm going to get right away to a few of the slides. Uh, you know, we've been talking for the last little while at York 
about really having that clarity of the vision of who we are as a university and talking about wanting to be a university and being committed to providing a broad demographic of students access to a high quality research intensive university committed to the public good. And all of those pieces of that vision are really important because it bridges and links together our commitment to access, to connectedness, working both internally but also externally with uh, our partners locally and globally, to striving for doing everything that we do uh, with high quality, but also if we do all of that well, really having a vision of purpose of the kind of impact that we're hoping to make on the social, economic, cultural, environmental, and other well-being of the societies that we're serving. And a, part, a very important piece of that, when we think about that commitment and, and working with communities, um, is also serving the francophone uh, and bilingual populations as well. I think that we have made some significant progress that the entire community should be uh, proud of. And we'll be putting out, of course, the annual President's Report and you can expect to see that um, in hard copy actually in September. But I did want to just highlight for you on the um, slide some of, just a few examples. You know, we've been talking about being research intensive, and it's a significant um, uh, accomplishment that we are actually over the $100 million mark in Tri Council funding. You know, that starts to move us towards the, the, that, on that particular um, metric of research intensive universities. We've been committed over the last period of time to thinking about how we move STEM from STEAM and how, what that means for everything we do in terms of also innovation. So we think, and we've, been ha we've had huge success in broadening how we think about innovation, not just around technology uh, when we think about that, but in terms of social innovation and the unique contributions that York can make. And that's what carried through to the opening of Y Space in Markham. And the fact that that space just filled a capacity in such a short period of time, with 22 startup ventures, uh, 2.5 million generated, hosting 117 different events with the community, is a tremendous opportunity for us as we move forward. And having, I know Glendon similarly is um, wanting to really expand that innovation hub on the campus, that we have this network of innovation hubs to bring together external. Uh, entrepreneurs with our own students and our faculty, on, on faculty members, on how we could actually you know, take what we're learning and continue to make that impact um, for society. The Canadian Observatory on Homelessness that was led up by Steve Gates, partnering with um, Away Home Canada. Just another example of how the work of our researchers is having that level of impact that uh, I always forget what I can announce and what I can't announce. No. Nope. Okay, sorry. More to come on that. Um, thank you so much for that. Uh, the, the contribution that Glendon has can you continued to make in serving the needs of bilingual and, uh, Fr and French language programming at, in, at the university level, and that has obviously a very long history, but continuing to think about how it can expand its programming, building on that strength in the liberal arts, but also moving into other areas in which uh, are of high demand uh, in the community. Some of the new, uh, always building on our interdisciplinarity um, of the kinds of programs that we're bringing forward uh, as, we, as, uh, as we had that commitment to bringing together and, and understanding that people really need a kind of a multiple lens when they're taking on some of the big problems, some of the big questions that we face as a community. Now I also want to acknowledge, and I think it's really important to acknowledge, that we do face some challenges. And I want to start off by acknowledging that the labor disruption that we had has had a profound impact on the community, which we still, in, in very important ways, need to continue to address. And we need to continue to address some of the issues that led to that labor disruption, not when we're at the table again, but, but now. We need to, you know, you, you don't want to take on some of these big issues when you're bargaining. You really want between what we're, what we're doing every day um, uh, uh, and, until we get to that next uh, time that we're sitting down together. The provincial government is also creating a tremendous amount of uncertainty for us. And I we really do not believe that the cut in tuition is the end of it for us. Uh, we don't know what will come forward with the um, budget, but all of you know that the impact of the 10% tuition cut is really a 16% cut 
because you know, all universities had assumed that we were going to be able to increase tuition by sort of in keeping up with inflation, so by approximately by 3% year over year. The fact that we had to claw that back, plus the 10%, plus no increase next year, that's another 3%. So the impact of our last filed budget with the board back in June and now is actually 16%. Significant. But it's not just about the financial piece. It's also about the approach that they're taking with universities around policy. And it's everything from the free, having to have free speech policy. Not that any of us would argue against free speech, but it's the, the way in which the government is interacting with universities. The student choice initiative, uh, the cancellations of the university uh, expansions. And obviously, it's very relevant for Glendon. For the university, of course, the Markham campus, but also the cancellation of the French language um, university. So it, it's all of these aspects about how the policy is being changed. And one might argue that we're starting from a place where perhaps this government doesn't necessarily fully acknowledge the value of universities uh, in the higher education sector. Enrollment is another uh, one of our challenges, which I just want to spend a moment on. And significantly, our domestic applications in particular have dropped um, compared to a system that's almost up by 5% if they take out York. Uh, I will say that our international applications have held strong, and those are actually up. We're above the sector. Unfortunately, the increase in the international applications will not mitigate the decline in the domestic, just given the relative percentage of domestic to international. I think it's really important to know that the total 101, that's our, the students who come directly from high school, combined is down by 11% in first choice and 12% in second choice. And really important to look at first and second choice because of course that's where we draw the majority of our students. I'm going to say that's a setback for us in our strategic enrollment management because actually after 2015, we were really building up um, applications again, and our applications were starting to increase, and we were looking actually quite strong uh, in 2018 uh, before the labor disruption. But we're really going to have to now start over again in those efforts um, around strategic moment management. And perhaps more significantly is just where York is trending when it comes to our market share. And you, York has always traditionally wanted to be at least have 10% of all applications because that s reflects our size. And you want to be sure that you're getting at least that percentage of applications that you have in the size of your student population relative to the total student population. And we are really have been dropping. We did a little bit of recovery, um, but, but now we're dropping again. And so this is something we're going to have to really pay very close attention to. I wanted to let you know at least what the financial implication was of that tuition. That's 16% over two years. For us, that totals $60.4 million. That is the cut that we're actually facing. And we made the decision on that, that there's no way that the faculties could manage that cut on their own and leave everybody else whole, that the only fair thing to do, especially since we were up against the deadline of getting out all of everybody's um, budget envelopes, was to roll through the budget cut for everybody, that everyone would have to think about how we could manage to bring our revenue down by that amount. And that worked out to approximately a 4.5% cut across the university. That gives you a real good sense of that whole impact of the, of the announced tuition framework. And what I really want to draw your attention to is the gray versus the pink or peach or whatever color you would say that, that is. Unless in the future, a government chooses to allow us to increase tuition fees over the 3%, even if we were to assume in two years that we'll get back to a 3% increase, we'll never make up that drop. The only way to make up that drop is if somehow out in the future the government were, allowed, uh, were to allow us to increase tuition or they were to increase the grant. Uh, the latter, I'm going to suggest to you, is not likely to we're not likely to see that in the short term. So what are next steps? You know, I always want to say that York has a strong planning culture. 
And I'm sure now and again, when you're having to submit plans and evaluate plans, it sometimes perhaps seems annoying. But that strong planning culture really holds us in good stead because we think about what our priorities are, what are the actions that we need to get there, how are we going to evaluate our success, you know, what, what is not working, what do we need to change uh, going forward, uh, and, that, and how do we align our resources with that. Uh, I'm going to say that the budget cuts, these, this tuition cut is not going to be easy. It's actually going to be very difficult. And we've taken an approach in conversations with our board that we cannot manage this in one year necessarily. So that boards tend to want a rolling budget. They tend to want to know that you can balance over three years. So what we've said to the board is we're going to need the three years to try to get this in order and, and to balance. But it's going to be incredibly important that we don't just get mired in this news, that we think about how do we continue to actually mitigate the impact of that tuition cut to advance the university, to draw in students, to address the, the impact of the labor disruption. And that is by continuing to do the things that we've identified that are particularly important, advancing our vision for the university, embracing innovation, enhancing collegial relationships on the campus, making strategic investments in priority areas. And on that latter piece, I really have to thank all of the members of the community who came out to the university budget consultations because we received very clear direction from that and that is going to shape and inform how we are going to uh, um, move forward with strategic funding. Now I want you to know that this is the Glendon's word cloud. The Glendon's word cloud is a little bit different than the university's as a whole. but. Um, we didn't think it was fair to ask the translators to translate two <coughs> word um, clouds, so we decided to just go with the Glendon word cloud. But one thing is the same in both world word clouds, and that is deferred maintenance. And we were not expecting that. We were not expecting to hear from people how deferred maintenance is negatively impacting morale, teaching and learning, research intensification, the student learning experience. So we have made the decision that we have got to start investing to a greater extent in deferred maintenance and to the extent that we have strategic funds available. This has got to be a top priority. Complement came up with a little bit of a sharper focus in the overall um, university word cloud, which also includes Glendon, but it includes everyone. But you see faculty complement still, it is relevant for, uh, for Glendon as well counseling, wellness, so we've really got to then look at that and figure out how can we address some of those big themes that are incredibly important um, for, for Glendon and for York as a whole. We're, there's a large number on a positive note of emerging opportunities for York. And that distinctive vision that we have, I think we shouldn't underestimate the importance of that. And some of our priorities. You know, obviously, especially with the, the hold now on the French language uh, university, we ever, Glendon becomes even more important, Glendon was always important in for, to fulfill that mandate. But there's um, a real opportunity here now for, to remind the community that Glendon was always here and we are committed to continuing to deliver that programming. Our pedagogical innovation, our experiential education, entrepreneurship, the program innovation, continuing to show that we are responding to the emerging needs, to the impact of what's happening with automation and artificial intelligence on the labor market. We're paying attention to that and we're ready to do our part in responding to that. Always thinking about the students. Students first and thinking about how we're actually supporting um, enhancements for both undergraduate and graduate students. Supporting graduate students was a big theme in the overall um, word cloud for the university and thinking about what is the opportunity for the Markham Center campus. Amplifying our scholarship, this is huge for York and the fact that we're on this trajectory of increasing our publications are doing very well, our uh, collaboration not only locally but internationally, our tri-council funding, uh, this is incredibly important. Thinking about our leadership, especially in the area of interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research. And so for Glendon, what is the opportunity for Glendon to build on the, the, the liberal arts and to advance that interdisciplinary research agenda? Continuing to expand the innovation network. Enriching collaboration, our international strategy. Our internationalization strategy is really huge for us in thinking about building up 
um, the diversity of our students, drawing the best students from around the world, supporting international research collaboration, exchanges for our students so that all students have some international exposure, internationalizing our curriculum. This is a very important part of a research-intensive, comprehensive university um, like we have. And thinking also about how we can work across sectors in taking on some of the big problems, whether or not it's poverty or unemployment or access to education or climate change. These are big issues and universities are, have never been more important in trying to support cross-sector collaboration in taking on those problems. Enabling all of that in terms of having a strong complement renewal plan, having that strategy for deferred maintenance, diversification of the revenue sources, streamlining administrative services, regaining market share and preparing for SMA3. Just want to remind you, there's a pot of money that's the so-called at-risk money that's linked to metrics, differentiation. And we are expecting that in SMA3, that government might be actually putting some more teeth behind that. So I just want to say that we are committed to having these conversations with you, to reporting back on an annual basis our budget, where we've invested money and why, uh, hearing from you on an annual cycle about have we got some things right, and where do we need to invest, what have we missed. The current fiscal environment is undoubtedly uh, going to impact the pace of what we can do, uh, as we're also trying to respond to less revenue. But as a community, if we continue to try to enhance our engagement and working together, trying to deal with some of the obvious uh, challenges that we still have to fully recover from, but being committed to York's vision, I remain very optimistic about Glendon and about this university. That's it. We are all open to take questions from you. Uh, thank you, President Linton. Um, Nous allons maintenant passer à la séance de questions et réponses, mais euh, permettez-moi d'abord de euh, dénoncer quelques règles. Uh, we are asking everyone to keep their questions to about one minute. Let's make sure that everyone, and we're numerous, has an opportunity to have their voice heard. We'd prefer if people focus on a question uh, but comments are also uh, appropriate. In either case, uh, please limit yourselves to one question or one comment per turn at the microphone. Uh, we want to have an honest dialogue, and that requires a positive, respectful tone. Uh, I have been asked to intervene if I uh, deem the question or comment uh, inappropriate or disrespectful. Nous avons un microphone ambulant. Et si vous voulez, un, si vous voulez poser une question, il suffit de lever la main et on vous la portera. Je vous rappelle que nous avons des services d'interprétation, donc euh, sentez-vous libre de vous exprimer dans une langue euh, ou dans l'autre. Cette conversation est aussi diffusée en continu. Si vous participez à cet événement par ce moyen et que vous souhaitez soumettre une question, veuillez le faire euh, par le biais de l'adresse électronique euh, sur le site de diffusion. Euh, certaines personnes ont soumis des, des questions au préalable euh, par voie électronique. Nous essaierons de répondre à un aussi grand nombre euh, de celles-ci que possible. Si votre question reste sans réponse, Euh, euh, nos invités s'engagent à vous revenir par courrier électronique. Euh, commençons donc, si vous voulez, euh, je ne sais pas pourquoi on dit « si vous voulez », parce que c'est moi qui décide, euh, <rires> par une question euh, soumise euh, à l'avance. Euh, so, uh, you will be hearing this question uh, through interpreting, it was submitted by a, ma a faculty member in French, and I will read it as it was submitted. Où en sommes-nous quant à, à la coexistence pacifique ou non de la future université francophone 
avec le Collège Glendon. L'ouverture à venir de cette nouvelle université risque-t-elle de fragiliser la raison d'être du Collège Glendon? Merci de nous dresser l'état des lieux actuels de cette question, qui est une source d'inquiétude pour la communauté glendonienne. Um, with apologies, I'm going to answer in English. I, 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 there'll, be, there'll be a day when I can, uh, can answer in French, but not quite today. Um, so, look, um, it's very hard to know, first of all, where the government is going to go with the French only, uh, the French language university. Uh, and that obviously perhaps makes a little bit of a difference for us, but whether or not it goes forward or not, I think we should still chart our own course with Glendon. And we will work, as we said from the beginning, we would work collaboratively with the French language university. And rather than focus our concern about what they do, it's about what we want to do. And it's about continuing to talk about the, what Glendon has done for all of these years, um, including over the last number of years, even expanding programming in, to meet new emerging needs. Uh, I do think that there's an opportunity for us to perhaps try to work collaboratively with Laurentian and Ottawa and the Francophone colleges on opportunities for creating a bit of a consortium. What are the opportunities to make it really easy for students? You know, I think generally in the whole system, universities need to do better on allowing and supporting student mobility. And this is no different for uh, those that are providing uh, instruction in French. Students should be able to move fairly easily back and forth. And obviously, we want students to take a certain percentage of their program at their host university. But we should be taking advantage of the diversity across the whole network. And I think, to be honest, to the extent that we could really collaborate and build a very strong network, that it almost makes the French language university, we don't need to worry about it. If, it, uh, if at some point they decide that it's really important for the French community to have a university that is, you know, has its own board and its own senate and that's run by the Francophone, for the Francophone, then we should work with them. You know, we've decided at Glendon that it's better to have a bilingual, uh, and I think frankly that argument still holds, uh, approach and uh, that we can be open to whatever happens with the French language university and they can come as part of the fold and we would continue to suggest to them, like we did when the proposal was first made, that don't try to compete with what Glendon already does really well. Try to be complementary. Maybe move into areas that we're not planning on moving into and maybe we can work with you. We proposed that when they first came up with really wanting to, when the Liberals wanted to really move it forward. So I think we've got this opportunity now, especially given that there's a pause, but it's an opportunity that we should always have been embracing and which Glendon has been embracing about how we can show and can, that we are meeting the needs although for both bilingual, those students who want access to bilingual programming as well as to those students who want access to French language. We are, I want to share with you, actively talking to the government, to Minister Mulroney, uh, about trying to help government with this file. That, you know, government obviously has faced quite a bit of criticism for not moving forward with the French language um, institution. And there's an opportunity for us to take a bit of a leadership in um, supporting the fact that we agree that, it's, that it is absolutely essential that we continue to serve uh, that need of the Francophone community, especially in um, central southwestern Ontario, and that we, supporting Glendon, is supporting that overall interest for the community, and that Glendon is prepared to take some leadership in really working with Ottawa and Laurentian uh, and the um, French colleges on how we can collaborate better together to serve those needs. What we have tried to show to government is to some extent creating more um, competition in the, in the area should not be done without looking at the cold hard facts of what's the demand, what's the programming that's already available, that's, that's doing very well, and then let's try to fit, fill the gaps and not try to replicate what is already available uh, in the GTA. Thank you. Okay. 
des questions? Peut-être sur le même thème ou sur un autre? Oui, ou char? Euh, le micro. Donc, sur le même thème, mais je vais parler en anglais. Uh, my name is Usha Viswanathan. I'm the interim director of the uh, Language Training Center for Studies in French, Centre de Formation Linguistique pour les Études en Français, here at Glendon. Um, I, I would like to follow up. Uh, thank you for your optimism, first of all. I really appreciate hearing that. There's so many wonderful things going on here at Glendon. <laughs> and um, my everyday life is full of wonderful things, and so I like to hear when, when people have the same reality. Um, I wanted to ask a question in terms of, uh, do you have some concrete ideas about, like you spoke, you had on this screen about uh, increasing the francophone population here, whatever that means, since that's a very complex issue in and of itself. Um, the francophone character of the campus, um, in terms of students, um, FSL students, uh, reaching, feeling comfortable, having the perception that they've had a, 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 a positive experience. So I was just wondering if you are looking to us for those strategies or if you have already some strategies in mind. So I'm going to invite um, any one of my colleagues to, uh, to comment. I'll just say a couple of preliminary uh, thoughts. I do really think it's important that we are listening to what Glendon considers on the on the matter you know you are closest to I think understanding um, what the, where the strengths are where there's further opportunity to working with the francophone communities um, and so it, even if I had some with thoughts and uh, unfortunately usually I do but um, uh, I, I would want to start from a place of sitting down and having a conversation you know with Glendon with your you know, co-principals uh, with the provost and really landing on, you know, what does Glendon see as really some emerging opportunities uh, here? You know, when I first walked in, there was a row of you there who were speaking in French. And I thought, what a difference it makes when you walk into a room and people are sitting and talking in French. And I know that Glendon has been really trying to enhance the culture of Glendon so that when the students are here, they are hearing French being spoken. It's not just you know, English being spoken. And I, so I do think that there are opportunities for Glendon to be continuing to enhance that culture, that experience. And I know that you've been taking some actions for that. And you know, if there are particular supports that Glendon feels that it could use to actually help that. You know, a, a point that we made with the government is you've got a French speaking community, you've got a French library, uh, you've got services being offered to students in French, an athletic center. We have deferred maintenance issues. Why don't you invest in Glendon? And then almost kind of, even if you feel that you have to uh, move forward with the French language university, is there an opportunity to kind of really think about a collaboration that would leverage some of the existing structure rather than replicating and building it all anew? So we want to keep those conversations happening as well with the government, but I'm really open to and want to hear from all of you about what more we could be doing to really be creating and enhancing that experience that the students and the staff and the faculty are having while they're here. It's not just about the programming, it's about like the whole culture, the policy, the practices that you have here, and, and the service uh, that's available. I don't know if our provost wants to add something. I wouldn't mind just adding a word or two. Thank you so much for the question. And I know that um, the Glendon community is in the midst of actually some fairly heavy uh, duty discussions about revisioning and renewing uh, programs about enhancing interdisciplinarity, bringing some things together to really highlight Glendon's strengths uh, better, uh, maybe introducing some things like micro-credentials that could be available to a broader uh, n number of uh, students out there at different stages of career who are looking for French lang language uh, improvement and credentials. Um, and so there's a lot of inventive thinking already going on. Um, you may have heard that the Faculty of Environmental Studies uh, at the Kiel campus and the Department of Geography are also in the midst of a revisioning discussion. And one thing that we did in that case was we commissioned um, some outside research 
to do a bit of a scan about what is available um, elsewhere in these areas, where students are, are gravitating, um, because of course student interests are changing constantly um, as they pick up changes in the labor market and society. And so I think that that sort of um, uh, assistance to do some deeper research about what could be uh, really appealing to students, what could meet needs that maybe uh, we're not meeting as well as we could now, what could project those strengths of Glendon even more effectively and that, that Glendon difference, that Glendon advantage uh, would be something that um, I would be certainly happy to talk to the interim co-principals about, about supporting that kind of, um, you know, uh, you're, you're doing all of the internal work to collaborate on a vision but there's also a big world out there of interesting things people are doing at other institutions in Canada, further afield, uh, and what stands out about Glendon. So I would look forward to more conversation about how we could assist. Further questions? Could I just add one comment yes, while we're please. waiting for a question? That really important opportunity, and I would love to hear what Glendon thinks about this. As a university, we have made internationalization a very important priority. And I believe that internationalization affords Glendon a very important priority. And obviously, perhaps the countries that you want to focus on, the particular partners that you need to cultivate might be unique, might be different. But I do think that it lends itself to a very creative um, culture at Glendon to have francophones coming from different countries uh, and so and, and just practically speaking even from an enrollment point of view uh, that can also really help because the total number of the population in central southwestern Ontario despite the fact that it is one of the fastest growing francophone populations nevertheless you know, balancing that with a really strong international strategy could really provide some sustainability um, not to mention the academic benefit, the research benefit of a, a strong international strategy. Des questions sur ce thème ou d'autres? Oui. Evan. Hi, I'm Evan Light. I'm an assistant professor in our bilingual communications program, but also the chair of our faculties. Um, policy Planning and nomination, Nominations Committee, which, among other things, advises the principals on budget matters. Um, I'm also, until recently, a member of the now defunct York University Advisory Committee on Responsible Investment. And there are a few questions about budget issues. Um, I'm, I wasn't here then, but I know Ontario went through some difficult times in the 90s. And I'm wondering, what were your strategies for dealing with similar cuts, I, I'm guessing, then, and are they useful today? Um, also, in terms of finances, I know York has a, a large endowment, but also reserve funds. Last year, the board allocated, I think, $60 million for a new School of Continuing Studies. Is there money at York that is being used for different ways to stop gap the next three years of budget cuts? Because, as you said, this is just the beginning. Um, and I'm also wondering, in terms of recruitment, I think about my experience. I'm from small town New Jersey. I wound up in Canada because I found McGill in a gigantic book of universities, and Montreal looked like a cool city. Um, and the exchange rate was great. York, it, to the U.S. market, York was, is a, a, a big deal. Um, so what, what are, are, are we trying to recruit in the United States to a significant level and taking advantage of that international student base um, on equal size with, say, China and the more typical international locations? So I want to start a little bit with um, the earlier budget cuts. Um, so, I mean, the main, there were two different uh, periods of time with significant budget cuts. And so the downturn in 2008-09 was all, all, a more recent, uh, you know, serious uh, financial situation for the university. And um, I think that the particular context that the university was in at the time makes a very different um, set of needs in terms of how you actually deal with that particular budget, uh, that particular budget cut. And so for example, in 2008-09, the university froze all hiring. That was, I think maybe all but three uh, appointments were canceled. Uh, some very, something very similar in, in earlier times as well. So I, I don't 
I wouldn't necessarily want, I'm not sure that we would want to default to any prior strategy. It's always good to look at what the university did and to consider. I think our approach this time is informed by the following. We, over the last number of years, really starting back in 2013, 14, the university undertook um, an extraordinary effort to take a look at our budget and our enrollment and programs that really were perhaps struggling and plans needed to be put in place to build those programs up uh, and to deal with the fact that we were not balancing in year. A few faculties were balancing in year and we were heading toward an $80 million um, in year uh, deficit and a gigantic carry forward and the board basically said this is not sustainable. You, you, the university cannot continue on this path. And you, many of you were there in 2014 and you know the review that we went through, you know it was challenging, but I want to say that fortunately today we are in a better place than many other universities who did not deal with their in-year deficits. I don't want to say that everyone is balanced in-year, um, many faculties are, some are still working on it and obviously we need to work with each faculty to talk about what is the strategy, how many years do you need. But the fact that we did that shift and that most faculties uh, and the other divisions are balanced in year, it puts us in a better place to manage with the challenges that we're facing. Having said that, we also as a team are of the view that it is time for the university to look at every single asset that we have, um, our cash reserves, the assumptions that are underpinning, what we put away to pay back our bond, it's called the sinking fund, um, you know, what kind of investment are we, do we, are we setting aside for deferred maintenance, for our classroom strategy, for IT strategy, we're looking at every strategy and what is the money that we have against that strategy. The, and this will be done in a very, shared with the community, in a very transparent way because we are going to have to ask ourselves some hard questions, which is, you know, if you had a choice between um, being a bit more of a risk taker, so in terms of the monies that you're, some monies, by the way, are set aside and it's non-negotiable. They're, they're, they're collective agreement provisions and you can't touch some of the restricted assets. But in some areas, you could ask yourself, do we want to take on a bit more risk? And because we need to spend now, uh, versus, you know, like sort of that kind of level of how conservative you think you have to be. So we're looking at all of that to see what flexibility we might have as a community and then what would we be prepared to focus on in terms of our priorities. We accept right now that complement and deferred maintenance are two areas that we cannot afford to compromise on. It really came through loud and clear, not only in the labor relations issue, how you know the full-time, the investing in full-time complement impacts the community, but the deferred maintenance issue, which I've already spoken to. So we are doing our best to look at all the resources that we have, to figure out and talk to the board about how much risk the university should tolerate. We, we obviously have to have some contingency and we have to make some investments in a variety of different areas. Also, what are all the pockets of other revenue that we could be going after? You know, do we restart the lands for learning? Are there ways in which we could use land to, for academic purposes still, things that are aligned with our mission, but that could also generate revenue for us? So we're looking at all of that while investing in complement and deferred maintenance, which were the two areas that we knew we, knew we had to continue to invest in. Uh, there was another question that you have, which I've now forgotten. Well, do you want to talk about how we're managing recruitment issues? Sure. Um, we actually have been uh, reviewing our international recruitment strategy precisely with the view to diversifying. Um, there is at York, like at most other universities, a very heavy reliance on one country, which is China, as by far the largest source country for our international students. And of course, we welcome those students. But should that change in any dramatic way, we'd be leaving ourselves very exposed. And moreover, I think that given our Focus, given our focus on a diversity of perspectives and a diversity overall, that it, it behooves us to be looking to many different source countries to bring top students to York. Um, so I believe that the U.S. is currently sort of fifth or sixth 
And if anybody has a better um, memory of that data than I do in the room, uh, please put your hand up. But I believe we're, they're the fifth or sixth country, so they're not that high right now. Um, so I know that we do have um, you know, some, some activities uh, focused on U.S. recruitment, but um, I'll certainly go back and ask uh, my team uh, for a little more information on that and be happy to follow up with you about exactly what parts of the U.S. Are there particular areas that we see as especially promising? Uh, from the perspective of Glendon, are there areas of the U.S. that might be uh, really helpful to focus on? It's ninth. Okay, so it's really quite far down the list right now, which is a bit surprising. Uh, so I'll, I'll be happy to dig into that further and, and come back with a little bit more information. I, I want to add one important comment about the School of Continuing Studies, because I really don't want the, to leave the impression uh, with you that um, operating money for the university should be used to pay for continuing studies. It's absolutely not. It's continuing studies operations whether or not it's the School of Continuing Studies or Schulich um, Seek or Osgood OPD, they're all self-funding. Otherwise, why would we have them? Uh, and the, it is sometimes the case that you know, we, we borrow money. We've borrowed, we've got, oh, in our past, I don't know how many of you know this, but we have a 500 million debenture that we do have to pay back starting at some, uh, in, in, in pieces by 2040. Well, have to pay it back. There, there, there's a financial argument out there that you just borrow another 500 million and pay off the old one and then you kick the can. There's an argument. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's an interesting, because eventually over time, that 500 million becomes smaller and smaller relative to you know, the budget. So, so I don't, let me say not have to, but we have to keep our eye on it and we have to make a decision about whether or not we're gonna pay it back. It's possible for us sometimes to loan a faculty, or a school of continuing studies, some money for some period of time, relatively a short period of time, as long as they've got a clear plan for paying it back. So the school of continuing studies has been setting aside money for some time on their own in order to be able to put a deposit down on a capital build because their ability to continue to expand has now reached maximum capacity because of the flexibility that they need for booking. And continuing studies always has to be booked after degree. We obviously can't prioritize them. And so now, in fact, we see the potential to grow the School of Continuing Studies and training and English as a second language, but not if they don't have their own standalone building. But they have to pay for the building entirely by themselves. And you want continuing studies operations for two reasons. First and foremost, you want them to try to act as a pipeline to degree studies. That's one big reason. Some students come in, they just think they want to do something non-credit, but they actually they then find out about uh, ways that they can bridge to degree programs. Well, actually, there's three reasons. Three, more and more now, especially with AI and automation impacting degree programs, there's huge opportunity just to have students do complementary um, you know, small little workshops or courses while they're undertaking their degree programs. Uh, there's also potential, by the way, for credit for Glendon to be offering a whole host of, you know, training kinds of uh, workshops, et cetera, that to complement your degree programs. But the School of Continuing Studies does non-credit. You guys do credit. And third, ideally, if you have a really successful Continuing Studies operations, they actually generate net revenue. And our principle here is that if the School of Continuing Studies generates net revenue, that it should be used for major initiatives supporting the university, like the Academic Innovation Fund, research intensification that all faculties can benefit from. So I don't want to ever leave you with the impression that they're not paying for their own building. We, the university would not pay for their building. Thank you. Um, we have received uh, uh, a few other questions, um, and since President Lenten, you have raised uh, the question of deferred maintenance. Uh, perhaps it's uh, an opportune moment to read this question, uh, which I will read verbatim. Uh, the state of Glendon's built environment is reaching a crisis point. While we are seeing some progress on addressing deferred maintenance, it's not happening at an appropriate speed and scale. What are you doing to ensure 
that the Glendon community has access to high quality spaces on campus. We're tired of promises and need to see action. Would it be okay if I ask the VPFA to start and then if there's Please. anything? We certainly did hear loud and clear um, about the issue of deferred maintenance in our consultation here at Glendon, but also at, uh, at Kiel. Um, I think that uh, through the budget discussions, uh, through the consultation now in, entering into budget discussions, you would find, if you were, uh, um, if you were me, a uh, very deep understanding by the, those who are responsible for the debate about how we allocate resources to university priorities, a very deep understanding about, um, about deferred maintenance and how much it affects uh, student engagement, how much it affects employee engagement, and how much it, it affects um, uh, just our ability to do our work. So um, we are bringing forward some, some, plan, some uh, requests through the budget process for a significant increase in deferred maintenance, both for Glendon and for Kiel. Um, and uh, I think I'm, I might project that we'll see at least a doubling of the investment in deferred maintenance on an annual basis in the coming years uh, uh, based on the conversations I've been having so far with my colleagues and, and what we've heard from, from consultation. But I think the, the real proof of that we'll see when the budget is approved by the board in June. Um, what's, one of the things that I think is really important and one of the largest disappointments I've had in my uh, short time here um, with respect to deferred maintenance is you'll remember the program for the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Program, which is a provincial program that brought significant funds into both uh, into the university coffers to deal with with energy uh, greenhouse gas reduction type projects. I think uh, Glendon received 1.2 million dollars because it's a low emitter. The Keele campus received. Um, a, I think it was more like $12 million uh, because it's a, it's a large emitter. Um, we've, we've basically are just finishing up those projects um, using the, the funds that were allocated to Glendon. But more importantly, we had an opportunity to borrow under that program $22 million. Um, and, and with the president's support, our intention, we had developed a plan to invest all of that at Glendon. In spite of the fact we would have to make the case for that investment uh, on the basis of, uh, of uh, reduction in, in emissions at Kiel. Unfortunately, the province canceled the program. Those plans are, are re remaining on the, um, on the planning table. Um, we, I agree, we need to replace them. We need to invest more in deferred maintenance. We need to, um, we need to deal with the state of infrastructure. Another important part, part of this come up in, through the consultation, and I think it's one that I'm certainly taking under advisement um, with my team in facility services is that we need to recognize that there's a differential cost of running a campus rather than just a faculty and a faculty that might have a building or two but running an entire campus does have a different cost structure. We've heard that and we'll, we'll be looking at that as well in terms of our, our, our allocation of uh, costs between uh, of, uh, of expenditures and deferred maintenance between Glendon and, um, and Kiel. And the other, other thing I'd like to add is I might see Peter Colasanti is here. Uh, he's been assigned directly to the Glendon campus to make sure that we're paying attention um, specifically to the needs of Glendon. We were talking just earlier today about the projects that are currently underway uh, and Peter gave me a number of notes as to the state of the projects. I see Anthony Barbison here too who was uh, who pre preceded uh, Peter um, being assigned directly to Glendon. I'm hoping and I, I'm, the feedback I'm getting is that's making a difference uh, here and you certainly have strong advocates um, um, uh, at my table, at my senior table, on the questions of deferred maintenance and, and other matters of physical infrastructure here at Glendon. I hope that's helpful. Could I just add something quickly to that? And that is just in a very concrete way that um, we, the University Budget Committee, uh, that's made up of deans and, and the VPs, um, hearing the message around deferred maintenance was of the opinion and based on an estimate from Carol about what would the normal spend be? What's the, there are standards. And so what's the, based on those standards of, of your total capital, what would the normal spend be on deferred maintenance? So we looked at that estimate. Um, for York, you have to add up the spend on the housing strategy and plus our, our strategy on deferred maintenance. Recognizing it was nowhere near where it needed to be and we needed to at least double the spend. It's about uh, $6 million uh, on a spend and then we get about $4 million or $4.5 million from government. We need to at least start from a place of doubling um, that investment. So once you agree that this is one of the big issues, then where do you draw the money from? 
I think all of you know that we have a university fund and everyone contributes. Every faculty contributes, every other division contributes to this university fund. Uh, relative to other universities, we, it's a relatively small percentage uh, that goes into that university fund. But the notion of the university fund is that although we're under a, a sharp budget model, there has to be an understanding that some faculties have greater flexibility than others. They have bigger problems than others. Some faculties have much bigger deferred maintenance issues than others. So to some extent, there needs to be an institutional approach to deferred maintenance. You can't just say to every faculty, go off and worry about your own deferred maintenance. So when you have people contributing to a university fund, it does allow you to make some strategic decisions out of that fund that allows for dealing with matters that really have to have an institutional approach. As I mentioned to you earlier, we're also looking at all of our assets, um, all of our cash reserves. Could we be a little bit riskier in some categories to even free up some more money? So we're part of the challenge with something like deferred maintenance, especially under a sharp budget model where the money goes to the faculties in the first instance, and then you're charged for, for you know, different kinds of services. Part of the challenge now is that we're not setting aside big pockets of money anymore. So we've got to actually think, well, where do you, where do you get the money from? So we have these, these couple of sources of money. Now you find the money. But there's still the important issue then about then how do you decide what you're going to do? What's the list of priorities? You know, what's the priorities for classrooms, for technology, for bathrooms, for things that are, you know, leaks, or leaks in roofs, etc. And that's why it's really important what uh, Carol has done to assign someone specifically to Glendon. Because it's not just a faculty, it's also a campus. And we need to agree together. And we're also looking at our process with the deans for how we actually prioritize. How do we prioritize the classrooms, the bathrooms? You know, I think you know we have a strategy for each one of those so that people feel and are actually being listened to. Okay, I've, I've, you know, I've, we've had our input in this, and then we get an approved list, and then we start tackling it you know, annually. How much can we do annually? So that's sort of where we are in a very practical um, way in dealing with deferred maintenance. Um, any additional or follow-up questions on this theme? Then I will uh, read another uh, previously submitted question, uh, which has been alluded to in, in uh, uh, your presentation, President Lenton. Last year, York experienced the longest university strike in Canada's history. It's safe to say that everyone in our community especially students, has been impacted. What steps are you taking to ensure that we don't see another strike? What is being done to address the root problems? This is submitted by a faculty member. So I'll, I'll definitely ask um, either, well, any of, our, of the team to comment on it as well because different people are working on different aspects of that. But I'll just start off by saying how much I agree with that sentiment. Uh, it was an incredibly painful labor disruption for all of us, no matter what side of the issues that you were on. Um, there's no doubt at all, based on all the student surveys that we get, that the frequency of labor disruptions, you know, it's not having a single labor disruption, but it's the frequency of the labor disruptions are seriously and negatively impacting our students and the university and our reputation. Um, you know, we hear comments really from the whole range of students to employers to government on um, investing uh, in York when, uh, from decanal searches uh, when people are concerned about the labor uh, disruptions on our campus. We must together as a community get ahead of this. Uh, is it easy to get ahead of it? No, it's not. Uh, we are taking a number of different steps. Uh, we've got to clearly actually reach out to the executives. Uh, you, one, you might refer to them as the Cross Campus Alliance, and which is not just the, some unions, but it's also some student associations, um, and actually sit down and have conversations about what people are angry about. And I mean, so obviously, to some extent, we know some of that, but have that conversation and try to identify initiatives 
that would go some way to addressing some of uh, that, um, those issues. Uh, the compliment strategy that the provost is leading, I'll let her comment on that, the provost, is a very important piece. Uh, you know, we heard loud and clear that people want stability, uh, faculty members, they want full-time appointments uh, and opportunities to apply for full-time appointments, and so the compliment strategy is a piece of that. I think, frankly, dealing with deferred maintenance is a, a, a piece of, you know, how people feel about um, the campus. I want to say though, so we're undertaking all of that, the conversations, complement strategy, transparency around decision making that underpinned the budget consultations, you know, trying to be responsive to issues around searches. Um, sometimes there is a compromise that the employer is asking for, but most of the decanal searches have been working quite well in the sense of making it possible um, to have a, a different types of um, engagement with the, uh, with the candidates. Uh, at the end of the day, though, I'm going to say that part of the issues that underpinned this last labor disruption included, and then we heard a, an, an individual at the community conversation that took place on Keele. It was a Unit 2 member who spoke. You know, I think all of us were seriously impacted by the eloquence of that Unit 2 member who stood up and spoke about how she felt she was treated by colleagues. Uh, it ranged from some things that we could do as a university, and perhaps the administration can drive how soon people know about you know, their, their teaching assignments and so forth. But there was also a lot about feeling less than uh, a regular uh, faculty member in terms of everything from their office space to access to certain kinds of programs to participation on departmental meetings. So I want to share that we, sh we, we must together uh, collaborate on changing the, the make, you know, making, turning the corner on how all of our colleagues feel um, at the university, how engaged they all feel, how welcoming everyone feels. It, it's not something that just the administration, I guess is the point. We have a role, and I'm not shying away from that. But this labor relations is not just up to the administration. You know, it, it, it involves all, everyone having a willingness to kind of let go of some of the past and say, okay, let, let, moving forward, what can we actually work on together? We are trying to take some of those steps. And maybe, I don't know, Lisa or Carol, you want to add uh, comments to that? Yes, thanks, Rhonda, for mentioning the um, compliment renewal discussions. Um, I hope people have noticed that there is a, a couple of papers that have been released. One is a discussion paper and one is a data paper to, to inform the discussion. Uh, and you'll see in there that I'm uh, asking a lot, for a lot of input from the community around, um, you know, should we think about um, uh, developing a target as to the proportion of our teaching that we want to have delivered by tenure stream faculty and how would we then build up to that. Um, another question that's in the discussion paper is what can we do to um, make our environment more inclusive and welcoming and respectful for contract faculty members. Um, you know, contract faculty are a big part of our community. They do, uh, uh, they, they provide a lot of teaching. They're very important to our students and we couldn't function without them. And so it's disturbing to me that we would have that many members of our community feeling left out or alienated or disrespected. And what I'm hearing is I have conversations uh, in small groups, one-on-one, -on -one, whenever I can get a conversation together with someone who's uh, teaching but not in a tenure stream capacity to learn more about what the, their experience is on the ground. Um, I really am uh, fastening on to the concept that the president mentioned that so much happens at the unit level in terms of what, how departments function and uh, what, what uh, supports are made available for the work that contract faculty do in departments, um, what discussions they're included in, where they can go when they're encountering an issue, um, an issue with a student, an issue with their space, an issue with their computer technology, uh, and ensuring that there is a place to go to get those things resolved so that you can do your work and feel that the conditions are, uh, are humane and hospitable and um, appropriate. 
So I think that we have a lot to learn and I think it's very important what we do outside of bargaining. Um, you know, we have uh, some time before we enter back into that world of being at the table in collective bargaining and that's a very important process that has to be done well. Um, but it's, it's perhaps even more important what we do in between bargaining rounds in terms of building relationships, in terms of trying to address whatever material conditions we can to improve the lived experience of being um, a graduate student, a contract faculty member. Uh, and so um, it's a very high priority uh, for all of us I know, for me in particular, having seen um, really the great harm that we all suffered, um, and our students especially, I, I think. But, but every, every last person on this campus, I think, um, felt negatively impacted by the strike, the length of the strike, the animosity of the strike. It's just not, I think, what any of us want in terms of the way that the university resolves issues and moves forward together towards the vision that we all see as possible for York. Um, and so it's, it's frustrating to everyone that we are not able to, uh, you know, to address some of these underlying uh, issues and I remain very open to and eager for input about uh, what we can do uh, to address some of those um, sometimes very specific, sometimes broad, you know, big issues about resource allocation. Uh, we need to hear it all and we need to talk as honestly and as much as possible about uh, people's different views of that and ideas about how we could uh, move towards uh, and demonstrate a real commitment to moving towards uh, an improvement in those underlying conditions. So I, I'm hoping that many of you will be willing to come out to consultations about uh, complement renewal and uh, will you know, be willing to engage in other ways around uh, collectively solving uh, this issue that we have. Thank you. Um, are there, uh, vous voulez poser des questions, si le moment? Le micro est ambulant, vous n'avez qu'à lever la main. Geneviève. Good afternoon. My name is Geneviève Maupeltier. I'm the interim director of the Teaching Commons. And although what we do is mostly faculty fronted, my question has to do with students. Because in recent um, months and couple of years maybe, um, in our work we're involving students more and more. And as I read uh, recently again, the uh, last academic plan, it occurred to me that students are at the center of this plan in many ways, but perhaps positioned as the receiver of that great education that we're all trying to provide. And so I'm wondering if there is scope and perhaps uh, appetite um, for, for the next round to consider how they might be an agent of what may, uh, what York may become in the future in terms of all of these conversations that we're having. I feel like we talk about them and we know when, when, we, when we interact with them at an at a individual level that their insights are wonderfully informed and important and, and it, it would be my wish for them to be more involved in, in what we do uh, and, and how we try to support them. A question for anyone. Um, I think that we should actually, there's a lot of nuances in how you could actually uh, enhance that. And perhaps rather than just list off a few things that we're doing, I'd rather say, I'd like to respond by saying maybe we actually need to bring some people together who are committed to student success and pedagogical innovation and talk about what does it actually mean to put students at the center and to have them really engaged uh, and, and listen to and fully leveraging what they are bringing to the conversation. There's opportunities for both undergrad and graduate students in that. And so maybe I'll actually, you know, the, the Provo is about to, uh, in the fall, with uh, and the Senate Academic Policy Planning and Research Committee uh, is going to be leading up and starting the discussions with the community for the next university academic plan. So the timing to really be thinking about resulting with a plan that actually puts that uh, priority at the center. It's perfect timing. And so maybe I'll, I'll ask her that. I'm just wondering also if uh, the VP of um, Research and Innovation from a research perspective, 
would maybe talk about, because there's such an opportunity here from a research perspective of putting students at the center and how we can engage them better in what we're doing in the research and innovation space. I want to thank you for that comment. Thank you, Rhonda, for that. Yeah, I, and we've been thinking about it actively uh, in terms of how to better engage students, particularly undergraduate students, uh, and, and give them opportunities to engage in a research experience and to engage in an innovation experience. Uh, and so we've been working hard, and particularly with libraries, in, in one, one aspect, organizing an undergraduate research fair that's proving increasingly successful every year, where we bring all undergraduates together from across the university uh, to talk about their work, what they've been doing, how they've been engaging. Uh, and we're now moving further towards working with uh, teaching and learning in particular uh, to try and take some of the innovation type activities that we've developed that are currently extracurricular and actually introduce elements or aspects of them into the curriculum and in that way bring research even closer to the pedagogy that's delivered uh, and, and innovation activities closer. Uh, so it has been something that we've been actively thinking about for the last several years, actively engaged in, and I think you, you can look forward to seeing more activities uh, th that are providing more opportunities for students to engage. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I also welcome the comment, and it's, uh, it's an inspiring one, and uh, it makes me think that as we start to get in in the fall and starting to develop a new university academic plan, you know, maybe we can think about some, um, some sessions where we get students involved and some design thinking about, you know, what would be the kind of program for our current times, given all the availability of um, uh, digital, digitally, uh, you know, accessible information, the rapid changes going on in society around us, the big societal issues that they're concerned about, um, the kinds of ways they'd like to make a difference uh, in the world, the kinds of tools they want to have, as well as, you know, the deep knowledge that they want to gain. So could we get students together to help us envision Right? What is teaching and learning for the future, for the future that we're only beginning to glimpse, and what would be really exciting and engaging for them? So um, you've got my wheels turning, Genevieve. I really appreciate the question, and maybe we'll talk about it some more. Thank you. Yes. Just a quick point, um, building on, on Rob's comment about particularly research and innovation and how students are engaged with that. We had a, a terrific event last night uh, that celebrated a, a number of students and some recent graduates as well. That's why I wanted to bring alumni into the discussion. Um, at the, uh, at the, the Launch U event, uh, and there, there, were, there was a contest for these, these students that are doing startup companies. And it's incredible to see the engagement of those students in a very non-traditional way, uh, and in a way that actually engages many other people in the community. And, and I think the students themselves are doing a lot of the driving of those, of those kinds of programs. Uh, we, had a, we had a number of alumni in the room last night. We had a number of community members and potential, even potential funders for these startup companies. And I think that kind of innovation and, and, and a, a unique approach uh, to those kinds of students that are interested in, in, in that innovation space is really, really terrific. And the work that we do in advancement, and uh, we, we have colleagues here, of course, at, at Glendon that are focused on engaging alumni, uh, really help to do that. It, it really enlivens that, that opportunity for students to be not just receivers, as you say, of, of, the, of the education, but to be participants uh, in the community. And we'll continue to work with, with our alumni to help do that as well. Thank you. Question du public. Nous avons. Oh, pardon, oui. Oh, oh. Dominique. <laughs> I'll just make a comment. We are conducting this weekend an ideathon at Glendon regarding uh, students actually looking at uh, academic competencies and seeing if there are universals. And we have colleagues from La Sonde and AMPD participating. So the, the students are at the center and looking at the existing and flipping it and coming with their own suggestions about academic competencies in the 21st century. So you're welcome to come and, and watch them for two days wrestling with those concepts. Uh, we've received a number of questions, uh, I believe, from uh, people who are live streaming. Um, I don't believe we'll be able to get to all of them. Uh, this one is in English. 
uh, will there be a greater effort made to reach out to Francophone communities and prospective secondary school students outside of Ontario and Quebec, i.e. the maritime provinces? Are there Francophone communities that have yet to truly hear about Glendon and what this campus has to offer? Yeah, I definitely believe that there are. And it's interesting, the out-of-province recruitment strategy, I don't think is something that York has probably done well enough. Um, it's often thought that it is the uh, Western and Eastern provinces who have to come after the Ontario students in order to support their recruitment. Um, people are always of the view that there's so many more students who want access um, you know, to universities in Ontario. And I think there is actually a, a very, uh, there's a lot of potential in thinking about how we could, and I'm saying that we don't recruit at all, but just the strategies that we have around recruiting, and, and perhaps particularly for Glendon, uh, those students from across Canada who might want to choose Glendon um, as an option. There's no doubt in my mind, and despite all the efforts that we make, that so many people still have no idea. They might have heard of Glendon, but they don't actually know really what Glendon does. They don't know the diversity of the programs. They don't know the research that's happening here. You know, you, how many times have we heard even government officials completely get it wrong with the, when they start referencing you know, what Glendon does? So I think we've got a piece here which is about the recruitment out of province, but within Canada, the international piece, but we also have a communication piece about how do we really promote what York is doing, what Glendon is doing, so that people fully understand and appreciate uh, the opportunity here. Thank you. Uh, les questions se succèdent. Uh, Est-ce qu'il y a des questions du public? Oui. Elaine. Yes, I always sound like a broken record because I've been saying the same thing uh, now for at least a year and a half because at Glendon, um, well, first of all, I'll say that York has signed numerous public statements saying that they're in favor of indigenization of the academy, that in addition, um, indigenous futures are part of the strategic research plan. And at Glendon, the entire weight of indigenization relies on one of my colleagues. He's the only indigenous full-time tenure, tra tenure track faculty member at Glendon. He's expected to do everything from organizing um, the indigenous uh, kind of orientation through to planning the jury for a sculpture, uh, an indigenous sculpture on campus, through to indigenization of the curriculum, through to organizing special events, and it's simply untenable. Um, he operates with the Glendon Indigenous Affairs Council, which has no dedicated administrative staff, and zero budget. So I guess I would make a plea to the central administration, given the list of priorities and the emphasis on Indigenous futures, to actually put the money where their mouth is and uh, give us some real resources so that we can support our colleague properly, first through Indigenous hire, so he's not the only one here, and secondly through administrative support and a budget. You're such an effective spe speaker. <laughs> um, that was really uh, very persuasive. Uh, argument and again in part it comes to thinking and remembering that Glendon is a campus as well as a faculty so that when we have a strategy at the university where we're trying to make a cluster of hires for indigenous faculty um, you know uh, experience tells universities that indigenous hires actually work much better when you have a cluster of hires and you bring in indigenous colleagues together and you're creating a community but again then if you have a number it's the number which you cannot, you just can't sort of add Glendon in as a faculty because then you end up with only one, you might get your share, so to speak, but then it's only one person here at Glendon and that is obviously a problem. So I'm gonna suggest that we talk to your, with the Provo, that we talk to your co-principals. Um, you know, we will be having another round, uh, another call that would be going out for appointments. The call typically comes out in, in May and uh, for you know, approvals for appointments for 2021. So there'll be another call coming out. And that, I think, is a very important consideration. It needs to come forward as a priority from Glendon, though. We don't tend to drive um, faculty priorities from the center. We, we, we drive, that comes from the, from the faculty. So that's a, a strategic priority that Glendon needs to specify. 
And while we're doing that, which is long term, because that won't be in place until 2021, maybe there's something that we could do, even for 1920, by way of a CLA, perhaps, to, to fill that gap. Um, maybe there's something that we could do in terms of actual services, so financial support, uh, maybe hiring um, a graduate student. So, look, I would say, speaking on behalf of us, that we're happy to have that conversation. It is a commitment, it is a, a research priority, and uh, there are some areas that we simply need to do better in. So I'm going to invite you, Dominique, uh, I don't know if Jan is here, but uh, to, uh, sorry, I don't know where he is, but he, oh, he's here somewhere. Oh, there, hi, Jan, sorry. To maybe talk to your colleagues and to come up with a couple of specific recommendations, and we'll see if we can't help support Glendon um, uh, in the short term while you're planning for a longer term strategy. Yeah, if I could just add, you know, quite apart from the Indigenous Futurities area of the strategic research plan, we also have an Indigenous framework that spans the student experience, teaching and learning, um, community engagement, uh, research. Uh, so it, it's quite holistic in terms of areas where we want to be looking at and analyzing how can we um, advance indigeneity and fully include Indigenous peoples. So um, uh, your, your co-principals did come forward with a request around a, a prominent piece of public art that would signal a welcoming campus for Indigenous people and that was a request to the strategic, uh, the university fund that was uh, approved. And so uh, when we tie things to those, uh, you know, those strategies that the university has adopted, uh, then I think you know, it is possible to look at special dedicated resources. So if more needs to be done, uh, we're definitely open to that, uh, to that discussion. Question? Uh, I think we have time for one last big one. Okay. Uh, uh, en français. Okay. Uh, you know what? Since we don't have a lot of time, I will, re I will translate okay. it. Sorry, je, je m'excuse uh, les interprètes. I don't know why I speak to them up there, but anyway. <laughs> What role does York Central Administration see for liberal arts in the 21st century? You know, I am always inclined to remind everybody that I'm a liberal arts faculty member myself. I'm a sociologist by training, and I chose sociology because I've always understood the absolute importance of the liberal arts to any education. Um, but we could be doing more here. And this is sort of all part of, and something that I would expect to um, emerge in the new university academic plan. And I think, frankly, it's interesting, you actually see other universities starting to talk about the importance of the liberal arts. And sort of York always knew that the liberal arts was important. It was always a strong foundation of the university. Um, but it's what we can actually do on the campus to really revitalize, to, to take a leadership role not just to be one amongst many universities that talks about the importance of moving STEM to STEAM and talks about the importance of the liberal arts and uh, the importance of interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity and understanding global issues facing the world. Like now many universities are actually talking about those same messages. But we still, I mean our origins were in the liberal arts. Before anyone was even talking about interdisciplinarity, York was talking about interdisciplinarity. We have that strength. Many of our liberal arts programs are ranked in the top 100 if you care about rankings. So uh, we, might, we, we lead in interdisciplinary research. Uh, we're distinct in social, understanding the importance of social innovation. So we have a lot of credibility behind our leadership. So what could we do over this next period of time to really concretely start trying to think about actions to revitalize the liberal arts in the sense of the external. I'd like to say it's, it's vibrant internally, but what can we do to encourage students to understand the value of a liberal arts uh, education, to make it more evident to all of these very successful people, how many of them actually have liberal arts degrees themselves. I do think there's more that we could be doing. At one Senate, I talked about the potential of actually a task force around liberal arts. I made that an invitation that if people wanted there to be a provocial or a presidential task force on the liberal arts, 
What could we do? What steps would we need to take? Um, one department on Kiel has taken me up on that as the humanities, and I've been talking recently to a couple of folks in the humanities uh, department at Kiel, uh, raised the suggestion of what could be done. You know, we've been talking about having um, a presidential um, uh, spokesperson, not spokesperson, um, speaker series. Thank you. Speaker series to bring someone onto campus that could also just generate collegial enga engagement with people. You know, we have pe some faculty members that said we never do anything socially. It's all, you know, it's just so much about, that's not true, we don't do anything, but we don't perhaps do enough. And could we do that around a really interesting speaker? Um, so people have raised with me, could we start to focus that initially in the first few speakers in the liberal arts? Uh, could we have a panel? You know, could we invite important stakeholder. I think mean, there's many things that we could do. And again, I'm more than willing to help support uh, that effort. And if there are colleagues at Glendon that would really like to be part of that effort, because it can't be driven from the president's office. I can support it, but it's got to be driven by colleagues. And I'm really happy to support uh, those efforts. I don't know if the provost wants to add something. Yeah, uh, could and for that matter, go on about this at length, but um, you know, I think that part of our feeling um, about uh, social sciences and humanities, liberal arts being somewhat on the back foot or feeling defensive um, comes from a couple of places. One, it comes from changing enrollment patterns out there as students are very, very anxious and their parents are anxious about career paths and, and might be questioning, you know, well, you know, will I be able to find uh, a, a foothold in the, in the labor market? with a BA in history or sociology or classics or whatever it may be. Um, so we have that going on. We also have the fact that York has been so strong historically in these disciplines that in fact the last 10 years or so there's been a bit of a focus on trying to become more comprehensive and actually balance the university a little bit more with stronger science and engineering and health disciplines and we're making some excellent progress in those. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about um, those science, those STEM disciplines, I think. And so I think that contributes perhaps to people wondering, well, does that mean we're devaluing this historic strength and identity of the university? And I would say that we absolutely don't want to do that. And so, um, you know, I, like many of you, read whenever I can about uh, directions in higher education and uh, where the liberal arts are going and I read people like Kathy Davidson and I don't know if anybody else has picked up Catherine Hume, a really interesting uh, person with a degree, a PhD in comparative literature from Stanford who's now working with an AI company around and using all of the critical thinking and communicative and interdisciplinary um, uh, abilities that she gained at Stanford in her PhD to actually help um, her, her employer work through very rapid changes in how consumers are using technology and how um, we're understanding all of these, the governance of these technologies. So I think that, you know, there's also Joseph Ayun, the president of Northeastern University, has written a really interesting book called Robot Proof, where he makes the argument that actually the human skills are going to be incredibly important in terms of people being able to manage systems, being able to work across disciplinary knowledges to solve very complex problems, being able to work across organizations. So I think that there's um, plenty of inspiration out there for what more we can do to highlight and um, position our liberal arts strengths for a rapidly changing future. Um, and that um, there's probably appetite for conversation. So, so I too, you know, would welcome. There's there's so much to do, right? And so we are uh, we're still, I think, pulling out of the difficult year we had last year. It's really great to start to feel some more positive momentum around big initiatives that people care about. Uh, but there's so much more to do. And so I hope that we can continue these dialogues and. Um, and I really welcome the question about how we can ensure that includes the future of the liberal arts. Okay, so let me just, just talk a bit about on the research perspective for just a little bit. I mean, we, we, I look at it and very much building on the historical strength that, that York has had in the liberal arts and liberal arts research and, and look at it in terms of what is the York advantage when it comes to research and it very much circles around the liberal arts. We already heard somebody bring up the, uh, uh, the strategic research plan theme of indigenous futurities. Uh, another of the uh, areas of opportunity is artificial intelligence and society. 
And I think that really reflects where that York advantage can be put in, that we can distinguish ourselves as an institution and in building on our tradition of interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity and really informing society and societal values with the, as, we, as we also develop our, our, our expertise in the technology sector and so forth. And the advantages of full of comprehensive universities to really bring people across those, uh, those disciplines and do things that, quite frankly, no other institution in this country can do. Uh, and just to cite one additional example of this, uh, as many of you may know, our, our largest single research pr project uh, is VISTA, Vision Science to uh, Application, uh, which, which started in, and has its basis in faculty of health, faculty of engineering, and faculty of science, but also heavily involves liberal arts and professional studies. And in fact, the, 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 the most impressive growth in that program has been through the Department of Philosophy and the hiring of new philosophers that are taking a liberal arts approach to understanding the values and the implications of these technologies uh, and, and as we go through uh, the fourth and the fifth uh, industrial revolution. And, and so we've really had uh, the opportunity, I think, at York, not only to continue to develop the disciplinary strength uh, in liberal arts research, but to really flourish in informing research more broadly across the university. Thank you. Uh, we uh, have almost run out of time. Uh, Est-ce qu'il y aurait une dernière question du public? Merci. Uh, we have, I think, run out of time. Uh, and one of... Uh, 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 Provo Phillips just said that there is an appetite for discussion. I think there's an appetite for conversation, but we also know there's food. Um, so uh, we thank uh, the guests. We thank uh, you for being here today. Um, uh, I hope you found the discussion informative and helpful. If you submitted questions, we have them, and they will be, um, there will be some endeavor to respond to them electronically on the part of the uh, administration's representatives who are here. Um, so please join us in this, I, I don't know if it's in this room, it's outside, for a, uh, a reception. Thank you. And thank you. Just on behalf of the team, I really want to thank each and every one of you for taking the time to come today. And uh, we really look forward to having future opportunities to have conversations, to hear your input, and for finding ways to follow up on these discussions in different kinds of working groups or committees to actually pursue some of the recommendations that came forward today. So just thank you very much to all of you. Sure. I'm just going to actually try and take this off though because